Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. Our lead story comes from Russia. It suffered a major terror attack a few days back. ISIS has claimed responsibility, but President Putin blames Ukraine. What does it mean? Why would ISIS target Russia? And how will Moscow respond? We'll discuss all of that. Meanwhile, the Israel-America partnership is in trouble. For the first time, Washington has not shielded Israel from a UNSC vote. Is Biden prepared to break it up? Can Israel afford it? We'll tell you. In China, top American CEOs are waiting to meet President Xi. What does it say about the U.S. plans to decouple and contain China? Is the Maldivian president having a change of heart? He's calling India a close ally. Is Kate's cancer video real or a deep fake? No end to conspiracy theories there. What Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar has said about the Philippines against China. Who is the new leader of Senegal, Africa's youngest elected president? Why football star Vinicius broke down at a press conference, how the Baltimore Bridge collapsed and how Mumbai is ahead of Beijing to become Asia's biggest hub for billionaires. All this and more coming up, the headlines first. Kim Jong-un's sister says North Korea won't accept any contact with Japan. The remark comes just a day after she said the Japanese Prime Minister had requested a summit with her brother. Historically, relations between the two countries have been strained, but Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is looking for a reset in ties. Five Chinese dam workers and their driver killed in an attack in Pakistan. A suicide bomber targeted their vehicle. In recent years, Chinese-funded projects have sparked resentment in Pakistan. In 2021, nine Chinese workers were killed in a bomb blast. A UK court delays its decision on Julian Assange's extradition appeal. The court gives Washington three weeks to provide assurances. The US wants Assange to stand trial for disclosing military secrets. There are fears he could face the death penalty if convicted. Togo adopts a new constitution. The West African country will move from a presidential to a parliamentary system. The current president has been in power since 2005. He succeeded his father, who seized control in a coup about 50 years ago. And homes belonging to US hip-hop mogul Sean Combs, raided by federal agents. The rapper is facing sex trafficking claims and sexual assault lawsuits. Combs has denied all accusations against him. We begin tonight with Russia. It's at war with Ukraine. It is challenging the NATO and now it faces a new adversary, the ISIS or the Islamic State. The ISIS has attacked Moscow, one of the deadliest terror attacks in Russian history. It happened last Friday. Terrorists stormed a concert hall and opened fire. There were 6,000 people inside that come to attend a rock concert. When ISIS opened fire, they were defenseless. At least 137 of these people have died. Many more are injured. Russian agencies have launched a manhunt. They've detained 11 men so far, including the four main attackers. In the last two days, they've been produced before a court and sent into custody. These are said to be ISIS men, but Russian President Putin believes they were hired guns, meaning these ISIS men were hired for this attack. And he blames Ukraine for it. Immediately a question arises, who benefits from this? This atrocity may be just a link in the whole series of attempts by those who have been at war with our country since 2014 by the hands of the neo-Nazi Kyiv regime. Putin says the attackers tried to flee to Ukraine, but the claim is yet to be established. So far, there's nothing to link Ukraine to this attack. Meanwhile, the ISIS connection looks plausible. The four men nabbed by Russia came from Tajikistan. It's a well-known hunting ground for ISIS recruits. The ISKP has taken responsibility for this attack. That's the Islamic State Khorasan province, ISKP. It's based in South Central Asia, mainly in Afghanistan, in what used to be called the Khorasan region. They want to establish an Islamic caliphate here, hence the name Islamic State Khorasan Province. It claims to have struck as far away as Russia now. But does the ISIS really have the capability to carry out such an attack? Now, experts who've been tracking the ISIS won't be surprised by any of this. A few years ago, the Islamic State rose and then collapsed in Syria. It split into many small units and the ISKP was one of them. 
In the last few years, they've ramped up their recruitment. Last year, in fact, the United Nations published a detailed report. It said the ISKP has thousands of fighters, anywhere between four and 6,000. They come from various countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Azerbaijan, Iran, Turkey, Central Asia, and Russia. So Russia was a recruitment source for ISIS. Now, let's say that this was indeed an ISIS attack. Why would they target Russia? Because they have an ax to grind. This is about the Syrian civil war. The ISIS lost ground in Syria and they blame Russia for it. At its peak, the ISIS controlled about a third of Syria. But then in 2015, Russia entered the Syrian war. They supported the regime of Bashar al-Assad and they played a crucial role in neutralizing ISIS. Since then, the Islamic State has targeted Russia. In 2015, they bombed a Russian plane, a chartered flight carrying over 200 passengers from Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt to St. Petersburg in Russia. The ISIS planted a bomb on this plane. Two years later, in 2017, they carried out a suicide bombing in Russia. The bomber blew up a subway car. And in 2022, they targeted the Russian embassy in Kabul. This too was a suicide attack. It happened right after the Taliban took power in Afghanistan. In fact, the Taliban's return has given momentum to ISIS. They're adding to their ranks and they're planning bigger attacks. So Russia must be on alert. Vladimir Putin has just won a record fifth term in office and look at his history. Just before his first stint as president, Russia suffered a series of terror attacks. There were apartment bombings in multiple cities in Russia back in 1999. More than 300 people were killed. Putin was prime minister then. He blamed the Chechen rebels for these bombings and he launched a brutal attack on them. Months later, Putin took over as the president of Russia. His critics say the same story will repeat this time that he'll use this latest attack to further tighten his grip on power and to intensify the attack on Ukraine. Not like he needed an excuse, but the fact is that Putin has been quite vocal about his commitment to secure Russia. So one can safely assume that he won't spare anyone who's perceived to be a threat. A campaign of retaliation will follow, and that could also mean more pain for Ukraine. Let's turn to West Asia now. A very important alliance is reaching its breaking point. The one between Israel and the US. It's been a rock solid one. An alliance that has shaped modern West Asia. But the Gaza war could snap it. On Monday, the United Nations Security Council voted on a new ceasefire proposal. Now normally, the US would have vetoed it. But this time they did not. 14 UNSC members supported the resolution and the United States abstained. So the ceasefire resolution was passed. It was the first since the war broke out in October. And what does this resolution say? Well, broadly, it says three things. One, a ceasefire during the month of Ramadan. Two, the release of all hostages held by Hamas. And three, more aid shipments to Gaza. Now, in the past, the U.S. had opposed all such resolutions. They vetoed three of them in six months. So what has changed now? What has changed is the situation in Gaza. Some 32,000 Palestinians have been killed. Almost 70% of the victims are women and children. Plus, humanitarian aid is drying up. Most of Gaza is on the brink of famine. So Joe Biden is feeling the pressure. Arab nations are asking him to change his position. Muslim Americans are abandoning him. So the U.S. decided to abstain from voting. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is quite upset with Biden. In fact, listen to his statement. I'm quoting, the United States has abandoned its policy in the United Nations today. This resolution will harm both the war effort and the effort to release the hostages. But Washington does not see it that way. They say their policy is unchanged. We're kind of perplexed by this. The Prime Minister's office seems to be indicating through public statements that we somehow changed here. We haven't. And we get to decide what, uh, what our policy is. So the U.S. is changing its policy, but they say they're not. Will Netanyahu play along is the question. An Israeli delegation was supposed to visit the U.S. this week. But Prime Minister Netanyahu has cancelled it. His defence minister also said the war will continue, meaning no ceasefire in Gaza. But can Israel really do that? Can they ignore a United Nations Security Council resolution? 
UN officials say they cannot. Israel is a member of the United Nations. Therefore, all UNSC resolutions are binding on them. But the United States has a different idea. They say this resolution is non-binding. So with respect to the first re uh, resolution, it is our uh, interpretation of this resolution that it is non-binding. Um, and uh, for any detail on that, I would refer you to the office of our ambassador to the United Nations, who can, of course, speak in more detail of how we reached that conclusion. So there's major legal confusion here. But politically, it's a signal from the US. Yes, they have changed their policy, but it's not a U-turn yet. It's not a complete abandonment of Israel. At least not yet. But we could easily reach that stage. You see, Joe Biden has all the leverage here. Most major powers have turned against Israel. Even U.S. rivals are backing Palestine, so it's not like Netanyahu can go running to the other side. Plus, Israel is a regional power. It cannot sustain a war against global opinion. Not like the U.S. did in Iraq or like Russia is doing in Ukraine. Because eventually, Israel will feel the heat and Biden knows this. He's got a lot more levers to pull. The most important being military aid. Israel has been the biggest recipient of U.S. aid since the Second World War. Do you know how much money we're talking about here? Almost $124 billion. That's what America has given Israel. In recent years, the annual aid has been $3.3 billion. That's 15% of Israel's military budget. We're talking about missiles, fighter jets, bullets, ammunition. Last month, a new plan was presented in the U.S. Congress, an aid package worth $17 billion. Again, pure military aid. And it's not just about the money. It's also about the type of weapons. You may have heard about Israel's Iron Dome. It shoots down rockets and missiles fired at Israel. The Iron Dome. Now, the Iron Dome is a joint project. Israel and the U.S. produce it together. So when the Iron Dome runs low on ammo, the U.S. refills it. What if Biden holds back on that? Israel could be left vulnerable. So far, Joe Biden has not done that. In fact, he's expanded his military aid since the war broke out. I've got some numbers for you there. By December, the U.S. had spent some 230 had sent rather some 230 cargo planes and 20 ships to Israel. And what was in these shipments? 21,000 precision guided munitions, thousands of bunker busters, 200 kamikaze drones, 57,000 artillery shells and 15,000 bombs. All of this in less than six months. So the takeaway is quite clear. Israel may be fighting the war in Gaza, but their weapons are American. If Joe Biden cuts off those shipments, Israel will struggle. They may defeat Hamas in Gaza, but they will struggle to replenish their arsenal. So it's a big lever for Joe Biden. The question is, will he use it? A lot of countries have stopped military aid to Israel already, like Spain, Canada, the Netherlands and Japan. All of them are American allies. Some U.S. Democrats are also pushing for it. They're asking the president to cut off military aid. Having said that, it's still a nuclear option. Biden would be up against decades of U.S. policy and tradition. But at this rate, who knows? Netanyahu is famous for pushing American presidents to the brink. We'll have to wait and see how Biden handles him. Now let's talk about Xi Jinping, another leader that Joe Biden is trying to contain. Again, it's a tough one. The US and China have been fighting a trade war of sorts for a while. But American businesses do not want to pick a side. They want access to the Chinese market. In fact, some top American CEOs are in Beijing as we speak. They're trying to get some face time with the Chinese president. The meeting could happen as soon as Wednesday. Now we do not have a full list of the CEOs who are there. But we do have some names that are doing the rounds, like Albert Burla, the chief executive of Pfizer, Raj Subramaniam of FedEx, and Milind Panth of Amway. Apparently, the invitation came out of the blue. These CEOs were supposed to leave today. They'd gone to Beijing for the China Development Forum, which is an annual event, where China invites business leaders, scholars, and heads of international organizations. Xi Jinping did not attend this forum. But reports say he's open to sitting down with a group of top CEOs. So Beijing extended an invite, and the CEOs decided to stay back. China is keeping it hush-hush. The guest list remains a secret, plus the invitation makes no reference to Xi Jinping. It simply says the CEOs will get a chance to, quote-unquote, meet a top Chinese leader. 
The Chinese Foreign Ministry was asked about this today, about this meeting, but it did not give any details. Guess we'll have to wait till tomorrow. But the point we want to dwell on right now is this. Why does Xi Jinping want to meet America's top CEOs? He's been trying to woo them. He has broken his economy and he hopes to fix it with their help. The growth rate in China has dropped to around 5%, which is their lowest in decades. And one big reason for that is the fall in investment. Last year, foreign investment in China dropped to a 30-year low. Now, the U.S. is some of the biggest companies in the world, so these CEOs can open doors. They can drive foreign investments into China. In November last year, Xi Jinping traveled to the U.S. He met with a large delegation of American business leaders. And this is what he told them. I believe that once the door to China-U.S. relations is opened, it will not be closed again. Once started, the cause of China-U.S. friendship cannot be derailed halfway. The tree of our people's friendship has grown tall and strong, and it can surely withstand the assault of any window storm. Did the pitch work? Well, it did not boost investments into China, but it did drive attendance at the forum in Beijing. Over the weekend, as many as 100 CEOs and heads of major financial institutions gathered in Beijing for this forum, and many big names endorsed China. I'm so happy to be here. It's great to be back in China, and we're continuing to invest. We have faced challenges before, and we have overcome them together. And China's remarkable journey stands as a testament to what is possible. China is a market of opportunity. It's a huge market. Uh, it's a market which is extraordinarily sophisticated. What explains these statements? While governments talk about decoupling and de-risking, what drives companies to China? It's a big, big market. Businesses want to hedge their bets. But can they trust Xi Jinping? He's been making promises and failing to honor them. In November last year, he said China would open up. But the fact is, China has been imposing more restrictions. It has blocked the flow of information. It has stopped publishing key economic data like unemployment levels. Plus, the Chinese premier has been avoiding business leaders. Every year, he used to meet them for a frank exchange of views. But this time, he steered clear of them. That's Premier Li Qiang. He did not meet visiting CEOs. He also stayed away from the global press when the Chinese parliament met earlier this month. The premier spearheads economic policy making in China. But when the same man distances himself, why would business leaders trust Beijing? And it's not like Xi Jinping will answer these questions or engage in a frank conversation. He'll most likely stick to a carefully prepared statement. Despite all of this, the CEOs are eager to meet him. It shows the gap in American strategy. They talk about containing China, but they don't have a plan to do it. So Xi Jinping is having a change of heart. And guess who else is? His newest ally in the Indian Ocean, President Mohammad Muizu of the Maldives. Muizu was elected late last year. And since then, he's had just one mission. Turn the Maldives away from India, or as he calls it, India out. That's been his plank. But his latest statement suggests a rethink, a possible outreach after all the rhetoric. Let me quote from what he said. I conveyed to Prime Minister Modi during our meeting that I did not intend to halt any ongoing projects. Instead, I expressed my desire to strengthen and expedite them. India will continue to remain the Maldives' closest ally. There is no question about it. Talk about a climb down. In January, Muizu virtually called India a bully, and now he's calling India the Maldives' closest ally. So what's happening here? Is Muizu reversing his anti-India ideology? After all that he's done, such a change is unlikely, but Muizu could be angling for something, maybe some help from India. Again, let me quote from what he said. The conditions we have inherited are such that there are very large loans taken from India. Hence, we are holding discussions to explore leniencies in the repayment structure of these loans. And there you have it. Muizu wants India to restructure Maldivian debt. How much money is at stake here? Some $400 million. 
That's how much the Maldives owes India, 400 million. Moizu wants New Delhi to restructure that, maybe delay the repayment or reduce the interest rates or maybe write off some of this loan. Now, most of these loans were taken for various projects like airports, bridges, houses. If the debt is not serviced, these projects could be halted. And Moizu does not want that. He has elections next month and his party does not have a majority in parliament. So the last thing President Moizu wants is for the projects to stop. Hence this outreach. Another reason is domestic opinion. Moizu's predecessor has lashed out at him. That's Ibrahim Soli. He had a very stern message for Moizu. Don't be stubborn, seek dialogue with India. It's what anyone would say. For decades, India has been the first responder in the Maldives. It has helped after natural disasters, repelled military coups and given millions in humanitarian aid. So turning away from India is a strategic mistake. And I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about simple geography. But the question is, has Moizu finally understood all of this? I'm afraid one statement won't cut it. We've seen multiple anti-India moves since he took charge. He asked Indian soldiers to leave. He cancelled a water survey deal with India. He bought drones from Turkey and he signed a security agreement with China. So one conciliatory remark cannot cover all of that up. It's too early to start celebrating. We we'll need to see some consistency from Moizu. Maybe some actions to back his words. Also, the debt alone is not enough leverage for India. And I'll tell you why. China is the largest lender to the Maldives. How much money have they given? Some $3 billion, which is 42% of the Maldives' total foreign debt. So let me recap that for you. The Maldives owes $400 million to India, but they owe $3,000 million to China. Who do you think will have more leverage? Obviously, China. So India should not read too much into Moizu's statements. At best, it represents pragmatism, a realization that he cannot just abandon India overnight. And I guess New Delhi will take that. After all, you can work with a pragmatist, but not a blind ideologue. Have you heard of the Streisand effect? It's when you're trying to hide something and end up drawing more attention to it. Looks like it's the term of the year for the British royal family. Last week, Kate Middleton made an announcement. She said she'd been diagnosed with cancer. It was a somber moment, but the internet has its doubts. They say the video is a deep fake. It's one of the many conspiracy theories surrounding Kate Middleton. She disappeared from spotlight in January, then released a photoshopped image, which she later apologized for. Days later, she appeared in this video, and now the palace is asking for privacy. But its actions are only feeding the speculation. Our next report tells you why no one seems to believe the royal family anymore. In the medieval era, touring kingdoms was a must for monarchs. They went around the realm, they spoke to people, and they made their presence felt. As Queen Elizabeth once said, royals have to be seen to be believed. Well, guess Kate Middleton didn't get that memo. Since before her marriage to Prince William, Kate's been somewhat of a media darling. She posed for photographs, engaged with the media. Even after giving birth, she was caught posing outside the hospital within mere hours. She was always in the public eye. But all of that changed this January. On January 17th, the palace made an announcement. Kate was admitted for abdominal surgery. She stayed in the hospital until January 29th. But there were no more details. After she was discharged, all her forthcoming commitments were cancelled. The palace said she would be out till Easter, that's March 31st. And it took royal watchers by surprise. There were speculations about her health. Britons questioned the lack of transparency. So on Mother's Day, Kate released a photo. It was meant to be a sweet gesture, but it soon backfired. The photo was manipulated and it fueled several conspiracy theories. It was called hashtag KateKate. There were questions about where she was, doubts about her marriage with Prince William, rumours about her health. Videos of her were circulated on social media. Netizens doubted if it was even Kate. All of this continued until this announcement. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. It came last Friday. The video showed Kate Middleton sitting on a bench. She started on a sombre note. 
Kate announced her cancer diagnosis, revealed that she was in the early stages of chemotherapy and asked for time, space and privacy. It led to an outpouring of sympathy. Wishes poured in from across the world. The palace thought this would be the end to the conspiracies, but new theories are now popping up. Social media says that video is not of Kate. They believe it's a deep fake. Essentially, it was generated by artificial intelligence. The internet is already down this royal rabbit hole. They've analyzed her mouth movement, how her hair did not move, the green screen-like background, the disappearing ring. There were videos breaking down the announcement. It was like a conspiracy theory on steroids. And it's unlikely to stop anytime soon. The palace says Kate has a right to medical privacy as we all do. She should take her time to recover. But that won't stop the internet. For the palace, the best bet was transparency. They could have revealed the diagnosis and asked for privacy. And this matter could have been put to rest weeks ago. Instead, they released half-baked statements put out a manipulated photo and further fueled the rumours. All of this takes away from the gravity of the situation. The palace may have finally come clean, but at this point, the dumpster fire is out of control. It's a PR disaster. No matter what they say, the public will take it with a pinch of salt. Buckingham Palace says it's now looking for a communications assistant. Well, it better be a competent one to douse this royal flame. It's election season in India. Normally, diplomacy takes a backseat during this time. The focus is on domestic politics. But in the current climate, that's hard, especially if your rival is China, which is why Indian diplomacy is on in full swing. We saw the prime minister travel to Bhutan last week. And now the foreign minister is traveling. Minister S.J. Shankar, he's in the Philippines. He had some very important meetings there, first with the foreign minister, then with the president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., a.k.a. Bong Bong Marcos. Now, the timing of this visit is also very important. China and the Philippines have been clashing non-stop. The root issue is the South China Sea. China claims almost all of it. The Philippines claims some of it. So both militaries have come close to blows. One such incident happened over the weekend. Two Chinese Coast Guard ships targeted a Philippine boat. They fired water cannons at it. Take a look. That's just one incident. We've seen multiple close calls in the last few months, and that's the background for Jay Shankar's visit. India, too, knows about China's land grabs, so New Delhi can sympathize with Manila. Minister Jay Shankar did not address China directly, but his message was pretty clear. Unclos 1982 is particularly important in that regard as the constitution of the seas. All parties must adhere to it in its entirety, both in letter and in spirit. I take this opportunity to firmly reiterate India's support to the Philippines for upholding its national sovereignty. Some quick context here. UNCLOS is a United Nations Convention. It's like a rule book for the seas. In 2013, Manila sued China under these rules. In 2019, a tribunal sided with Manila. It rejected China's claims over the disputed waters. Back then, India did not say very much. India just noted this UNCLOS verdict. But now, India is openly supporting it. It is asking China to adhere to the 2019 verdict. In simple words, India has finally picked a side and it is supporting the Philippines against China. But what does this partnership look like? What is the foundation of it? Well, there are many. Number one is the shared threat. India faces Chinese expansionism in the Himalayas. The Philippines faces it in the seas. Different regions, but the same problem. Number two is trade. In 2015, bilateral trade was around $1.9 billion. In 2022, it has reached close to $3 billion, which is a 58% rise in seven years. And there's, there's potential for a lot more. 
Finally, factor number three, military cooperation. In 2022, the Philippines bought Brahmo's missiles from India. The deal is worth $370 million, $370 million. The delivery is expected to start this year. Reports say they're also keen on the Tejas fighter jet. Both sides also make regular port calls. In fact, an Indian warship docked in Manila on Monday. It's on a three-day mission to the Philippines. So there's a lot going for both sides. But the catalyst remains China. There's a common thread between their claims over Indian and Philippine land. India has no right to unilaterally develop Zhangnan, known as South Tibet in English, which belongs to China. India's actions will only further complicate the border issue and create negative disturbance in the border areas of the two countries. In the face of illegal intrusion of the Philippine vessels, the Chinese Coast Guard has taken necessary law enforcement measures. Their response on the scene was legitimate, professional and restrained, which is beyond reproach. Manila is arguably worse off. They've summoned China's top diplomat in the Philippines, also lodged a diplomatic protest. But the good news is they have support. The U.S. is backing Manila. The European Union is backing Manila. So are Japan and South Korea. Now India is joining that same camp. It will help New Delhi project power in a new region. We saw evidence of that last year. India and the Philippines held joint drills in the South China Sea. It was also open up. It will also rather open up new economic frontiers. After all, Manila is a member of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So military and strategic ties with the Philippines could give India leverage. Of course, the downside is poking China. Beijing has criticized India's drills in the South China Sea. It has also asked New Delhi to respect its claims in the region. Now, Manila has a mutual defense treaty with the U.S. Washington has repeatedly promised to defend them, but India has no such backup. So while using China to build this relationship is okay, New Delhi must expand it, create a partnership that goes beyond Beijing. Our next story is from Senegal, a nation in West Africa. They just had an election and they're set to welcome Africa's youngest ever elected president. The provisional results are in and the people of Senegal have chosen. They're bringing in Basiru Diome Fay. Fay turned 44 yesterday. Twelve days ago, he was in jail. He's a former tax inspector who says he's bent on eradicating corruption. Well, that profile may sound similar to our Indian viewers, but Fay is not really one for the limelight. He has bluntly said that he is a proxy for Senegal's most famous opposition leader, Usmane Sonko. Here's our report. Senegal went to polls on Sunday. It was supposed to be a close election. A David versus Goliath showdown between the old guard and the new, between established politicians and young upstarts, between business as usual and a political overhaul. At the end of the day, it wasn't much of a contest. The old system has fallen and a new Senegal seems to have emerged, helmed by this man. Basiru Diomaye Fai. The Senegalese people have chosen to break with the past, to give substance to the immense hopes raised by our vision of society. I hope that our vision of society has given substance to their aspirations. Fai will be Senegal's next president. The final vote count isn't out yet, but all his major opponents have conceded defeat and congratulated Fai on his victory including former Prime Minister Amadou Ba. Congratulations once again to President Diomai Fe. I wish him every success at the helm of our country. May God accompany him as he carries out his mission for the greatness of our nation and the well-being of our population. Basiro Diomai Fai is set to become Africa's youngest ever elected president. Yesterday wasn't just the day Fai won the election, it was also his 44th birthday. Fai isn't some career politician. He hasn't spent decades in parliament before trying to win the presidency. If you actually look at his story, it seems to be a miracle that he will become president. 
Phi spent most of his 20s and 30s in a government job as a tax inspector. The tax job is where he cut his political teeth. He helped form unions, fought for workers' rights, and it is there that he met his political mentor, Usman Sonko. Usman Sonko is the rock star politician, the one who energizes the crowd, the one who inspired the revolution against the old regime. Another former tax inspector, Sonko entered politics to tackle corruption in Senegal. Sonko contested and came third in Senegal's last presidential election. This was in 2019. Throughout that campaign, Fai was his loyal right-hand man. Fai has been at Sonko's side since their tax inspector days. He has been helping Sonko try and change the system. But Sonko's popularity came at a price. Their former party, PASTEF, came under attack in 2021. The establishment eventually jailed Sonko and dismantled the party. Sonko was barred from running for president over a conviction in a defamation case. Fai was also thrown behind bars last year. But crucially, the right-hand man was not disqualified from standing for the presidency, which is when the plan was hatched. Fai would be Sonko's proxy. Sonko is Fai, Fai is Sonko. That was a slogan used in the run-up to this election. Fai has no problem with that. Sonko too is happy that Fai won. He is more upright than me, he's more organized than me and he has better methods. I'm more eloquent and more handsome, but he's better. The two have worked together for years. They share a close friendship. One of Fai's sons was even nicknamed Usman after Sonko. But the real test begins now. Senegal has put a lot of faith in these two men. Let's hope they deliver. Now let's turn our attention to Spain, where a football match will be taking place later tonight. It will be Spain versus Brazil. On the face of it, it doesn't mean much. It's an international friendly, not really a big deal. No qualifications on offer, no tournament berths, just an entertaining game of football between two world-beating sides. But that's just the surface. Dig deeper and you'll realize the significance. The match is Brazil versus Spain at the Santiago Bernabeu the home of Real Madrid. So tonight's match throws together club and country for one player, Vinicius Junior. It's going to be a dream come true, being able to play at my home in Spain, the Bernabeu, wearing the Brazilian jersey. I always dreamt about it and this is the first time. The mercurial Brazilian winger at the eye of a storm, the racism storm engulfing Spain, Vinicius is 23 years old. He left Rio de Janeiro in 2018. He's been in Spain for about six years. And in these six years, he has been subjected to some of the worst racist abuse imaginable. The racist incidents have been increasing year on year. And the worst took place last May during a match against Valencia. Valencia fans were seen hurling abuses at Vinicius. Racist abuses, the fans were, hurl were riling him up, trying to throw him off his game and eventually they succeeded. Vinicius got caught up in a brawl. And even though he did not start it, he was unfairly sent off. Real was furious. They ordered an investigation and Valencia, to their credit, complied. They identified three fans and the fans were then prosecuted by Spanish authorities for hate speech. But the racist genie was truly out of the bottle. Over the last year, there have been at least 10 racist incidents involving Vinicius. Fans at Barcelona, Sevilla and Atletico Madrid have abused Vinicius. They know the racist taunts will affect the Real Madrid star, so they keep hurling abuse at him. And while he may be a footballing superstar, but at the end of the day, Vinicius is a human being, a 23-year-old to boot. So, of course, he reacts, and the racism has taken a toll. It all came out yesterday. I arrive at every game with my head focused on the game in order to do my best for my team. But that's not always possible. I need to focus really hard every day. I'm sorry, I just want to play football. I just want to play. I just want to do whatever I can for my club and for my family. 
That is a football legend in the making, reduced to tears because of constant abuse. Sent his way by people without a shred of empathy or humanity, the absolute worst sort of football hooligans. Vinicius broke down during a pre-match press conference, but he did not end the presser. He continued to take questions and say his piece. When asked about how to end the racism, he said that football's governing bodies had to do more. FIFA, UEFA, Spain's football governing body and even the clubs themselves, everyone needs to step up. They can't just take action when an incident goes viral and ignore it every other day. They need to tackle the problem head on. Maybe take a leaf out of Brazil's book. Last year after the Valencia incident, Rio de Janeiro brought in a new law. They called it the Vinny Junior Law after Vinicius. It punishes football fans for racist behavior with up to five years in prison. The law sends a strong message to the racists. It acts as a deterrent. It may not change minds, but it will make the racists fear consequences. And this kind of law should be widespread. It's the least that FIFA can do to protect players. It's the bare minimum protection that people like Vinicius deserve. As for the star himself, he's finding his own ways to deal with the abuse. I've never really thought about leaving, because if I leave, I'm giving these racists what they actually want. So I'm going to stay here, fighting, playing in the best club in the world, winning titles, scoring many goals. And they'll have to see my face even more, because I'm only evolving, playing football and bringing joy to my people. We hope he succeeds. It would be the best response to those who target him. In the U.S., the state of Maryland has declared an emergency. It follows an incident that looks more like a Hollywood stunt. You have to see it to believe it. This is what happened in Baltimore. A ship struck a bridge. The bridge snapped and collapsed. Reports say the ship was manned entirely by a crew of Indians. Now, none of the crew members were injured, but the, vehicle, the vehicles and people on the bridge were plunged into the water. Reports say at least 20 people fell into the water. Two survivors have been pulled out. One of them is in a serious condition. Authorities are calling it a mass casualty event. Our next report tells you more. At around 1.30 a.m. today, according to Eastern Daylight Time, an unlikely catastrophe struck Baltimore in the U.S. state of Maryland. A 948-foot container ship struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge. This is a major bridge in Baltimore. It is 2.57 kilometers long and stands on the Patapsco River. Upon collision, the bridge snapped and collapsed. At least 20 people and several vehicles were plunged into the river. Meanwhile, the ship caught fire, sending plumes of thick smoke into the air. So far, two people have been rescued. One of them is in critical condition. Emergency services are calling this a mass casualty event, and Maryland has declared a state of emergency. We're basically searching for, for everyone that was potentially on the bridge. The Coast Guard's primary mission right now is search and rescue, looking for any survivors in the water. We're working with numerous federal, state and local partners on scene on these search and rescue efforts. This disaster may be the worst U.S. bridge collapse since 2007. That's when the I-35W bridge in Minneapolis collapsed into the Mississippi River, killing 13. Many are still unable to grasp the scale of this event. I really ran and looked. <laughs> I went over there and sure as anything, it was gone. The whole bridge was just like, there was nothing there. And I started recording. I was like, I can't believe this. Question is, how did it happen? According to the White House, there was no indication of nefarious intent. According to Maryland Governor Wes Moore, the ship had lost power. The crew lost control. They alerted authorities about it and issued a mayday request. But around the same time, the ship collided with the bridge. It's likely that um, significant investigation will need to take place on what, on what remains. Um, rebuilding will take a long time. But other than the investigation and search and rescue, there's another major problem at hand. We're losing a very main port for our transportation, our distribution, all of it. Like, I'm worried about how people are going to be getting food, <laughs> water, because trucks for transport or like um, cargo delivery trucks, they, 
they take the key bridge every day. There's hundreds of them on the bridge every day. Port Baltimore is one of the busiest U.S. ports. It is the busiest for car shipments. After the accident, it has been closed. This threatens to disrupt supplies of goods, from cars to coal, and even basic commodities like sugar. This is bound to increase delays and costs. This incident is as rare as it is shocking. Singapore, where the vessel was registered, will also launch an investigation into the ship. And while foul play has been ruled out, there are still many unanswered questions as to what caused this accident and whether it could have been avoided. In India's Ladakh, hundreds of people have been protesting at the center of it is a man called Sonam Wangchuk, an innovator and climate activist. On the 6th of March, he started a hunger strike. It has ended today, but the demands still remain. Here's what they want. Constitutional safeguards for Ladakh and protection of Ladakh from industrialization. It's a tough one for the government, balancing ecological concerns with economic needs, ensuring development without hurting the environment. Here's a report. On March 6th, hundreds gathered in Leh. The temperatures were sub-zero, but that did not stop the crowd. They showed up in support of this man, Sonam Wangchuk, an engineer and education reformer from Ladakh. Wangchuk was starting his climate fast. It was to make his demands heard. The hunger strike would go on for 21 days. It has finally ended today. But the demands remain the same include Ladakh in the sixth schedule of the constitution and give statehood to the region. The sixth schedule ensures autonomy for tribal areas. It also guarantees land protection. And that's what Wangchuk wants for Ladakh. Then there are climate-related demands, like protecting Ladakh's fragile ecosystem. From development projects, growing industrialization, industrial mining, and the expanding tourism. These are valid concerns. But equally important is Ladakh's economic growth. The region is rich in natural resources. There's limestone, which is used for construction. There are reserves of sulfur, used for making car batteries, oil refining and mineral extraction. And borax, a substance only found in Ladakh in India. It's a major ingredient in household cleaners. Several industrial groups have shown interest in this. They want to explore the region. Hydropower is another frontier. Seven projects have been proposed so far. It could bring in a lot of money. So the government has to balance ecological concerns with economic needs. In 2019, they promised to include Ladakh in the constitution's sixth schedule. But progress has been limited. The central government has met with the protesters. It has also promised to review the demands. But so far, nothing concrete. Last year, the Home Minister set up a high-powered committee on Ladakh. It was to discuss constitutional safeguards for the region. The sixth schedule provides for the formation of ADCs, that's Autonomous District Councils. They are essentially autonomous administrative regions. They have legislative, judicial and administrative autonomy in a state. They can make laws and regulations regarding the area, including jobs. Currently, it applies to the states of Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram and Tripura. The protesters want the same for Ladakh. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has promised to develop Ladakh as a carbon-neutral destination. The plan is to use green energy to power Ladakh's growth. The way forward will be through consensus building. One climate fast may have ended today, but the protest is not over. Our next story comes from Mumbai, the financial capital of India. Mumbai is also called the maximum city for a number of reasons, including its number of billionaires now. Mumbai has 92 billionaires, the maximum in Asia. It has surpassed Beijing for the first time and is among the top three billionaire capitals in the world. Mumbai comes after New York and London. So what is driving this billionaire boom and what does it mean for India? Our next report tells you. If the movie Crazy Rich Asians had a sequel, there's a good chance it could be based in Mumbai, India's financial capital. After all, Mumbai is now home to 92 billionaires. The city has emerged as Asia's billionaire hub and ranks third globally, after New York's 119 billionaires and London's 97. What's more, Mumbai has surpassed Beijing for the very first time, edging past its 91 billionaire count. 
As a country though, China has the highest number of overall billionaires, followed by the US, then India. In terms of numbers, China has 814 billionaires compared to India's 271. That's a threefold difference. Yet Mumbai has come out on top. This is a huge feat, but what's behind it? There are two aspects here. First, wealth creation in China has undergone massive changes. Between 2022 and 2023, its number of ultra-rich has shrunk by 155. The country's real estate market is in trouble. Its renewable energy sectors are struggling to grow. Its stock market has remained weak. So the overall wealth of Chinese billionaires has fallen by 15%. But there's another reason here. India's growth. Last year was a strong one for the country. Its already robust economy grew by 7.5% as did confidence in the Indian economy. India added 94 people to its list of billionaires last year. That's the highest number since 2013. Many existing billionaires also grew richer. These factors have put India on the global wealth map and fueled a meteoric rise in its billionaire count. Now, while Mumbai has put India's growing prosperity on showcase, New Delhi has entered the list of top cities as well, which further underscores this rise. But while India's wealth is rising, so is its inequality. Its wealth inequality has been rising sharply for the last three decades. According to Oxfam, the top 10% of the Indian population holds 77% of the total national wealth. And this contrast is clear in Mumbai as well. It may be Asia's billionaire hub, but it's also home to Asia's largest slum. That being said, rise in wealth is overall a good thing for India. This growth in particular in sectors like pharmaceuticals and auto has fueled the economic confidence in the country. So Indian cities taking on the world as billionaire hubs is worth cheering. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In the UK, a convoy of tractors drove outside the parliament to protest against post-Brexit trade deals. In South Korea, police chase a runaway ostrich through the traffic after it broke free from a zoo. And in Mexico, wildfires continue to ravage parts of the country. Finally, taking you back in history on this day in 1979, Israel and Egypt signed a historic peace agreement. It came after five wars in three decades. Egypt was the first Arab nation to sign a peace deal with Israel. Since then, five other Arab countries have followed suit. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.